Hey guys, welcome to Man Medicine, where we talk about how men can optimize their health and escape the collapsing U.S. healthcare system. Well, the GLP-1 agonists are getting they're getting a lot of press these days. You know, a medication is uh, is popular when South Park <laughs> devotes an entire episode uh, to how crazy people are about these drugs. But I want to talk with you guys today about a different class of drugs, which I think may have even more, at least long-term potential for those of us interested in health and longevity, not just people with diabetes, heart failure, kidney disease. We're going to talk about that too. And also perhaps for some of you naughty boys out there who are taking too many androgens and want to come up with a safer, uh, or shall we say a, um, a damage control protocol to limit the amount of, um, potential risk that you take when you uh, when you take these drugs. So we're going to talk about that. These drugs are a, a class called SGLT2 inhibitors. These are fascinating drugs. So we'll talk about what these drugs are, what they're indicated for, and I'm going to speculate a little bit based on the data um, on how these drugs could potentially be uh, a perhaps anti-aging drugs. I don't really like the term anti-aging, but certainly could have some health promoting effects in non-diabetics even, and also how they could potentially be part of a harm reduction protocol for those of you guys who are using anabolic steroids in uh, your pursuit of a better physique in uh, sports performance, bodybuilding, et cetera. All right, so how do these drugs work? Well, it turns out in your kidney, specifically the nephron, which is the functional unit of the kidney, in the proximal tubule, there is an SGLT2. Okay, it's a sodium glucose uh, co-transporter. What it does is it reabsorbs glucose out of your urine so you're not constantly just peeing out sugar all the time. It inhibits that. So of course, what do you do? You end up dumping a certain amount of glucose right out of the urine. It lowers serum uh, glucose levels. And basically that, um, that glucose remains, um, it's unabsorbed. It's not used by your body. It just gets excreted. And so by that mechanism, it lowers blood sugar. These drugs have been around for a long time. And I have to be honest, when when they first came out and I learned about the mechanism of these drugs, I thought, okay, well, great. You know, that's, that's a novel way of lowering blood sugar. Um, we're not increasing the way that it's uptake. We're not increasing its uptake in the cells. We, um, we're not increasing insulin to help with, you know, disposal, et cetera. We're just excreting it. And I thought, okay, well, the, you know, there'll be some utility. There'll be a subset of people that perhaps benefit from these drugs, but they're not going to be that impressive. And I was completely wrong. <laughs> and when I'm wrong, I'm really wrong. Um, it has turned out over the last few years, we've discovered some really remarkable additional benefits outside of the kidney in, um, in, uh, with these drugs. So they have now become like first line in uh, congestive heart failure. They're a staple of uh, many patients with chronic kidney disease. And of course, you know, the indication remains for type two diabetes, but I'm going to show you, there's also some interesting data on um, mitigating like ventricular remodeling, which is something that's, uh, it's a very common pathological process that leads to heart failure. And uh, I deal with a lot of heart failure in my hospital practice. We're going to talk about the effects of anabolic steroids on the heart and how potentially, although there's been no studies on this yet, how potentially these drugs maybe could help mitigate some of that. I think there's a plausible mechanism there, and that's um, going to be one of the focuses of, of this talk today. So these are the ones that are currently available in the U.S., and you'll know all these drugs because they all, they all, the generics all end in flozin, F-L-O-Z-I-N. So we have uh, empagliflozin, which is uh, uh, Jardiance. That's probably the best known one in the U.S. because it's just heavily, heavily marketed. There's Invokana, which you may have heard of. That's Canagliflozin, Ferixca, uh, Depagliflozin, uh, Steglatro, which I've never used or heard of. It's Ertugliflozin. And then there's uh, Brenzavi. I, I don't know where they come up <laughs> with these names. Uh, that's Bexaflozin. And then in 2023, uh, May 2023, they FDA approved uh, Sotagliflozin. They all work roughly the same way. Um, they all have like slightly different pharmacokinetics and uh, slightly different um, properties, but I'm not going to get into that. They are currently indicated FDA approved for treatment of type 2 diabetes, um, chronic kidney disease, specifically diabetic nephropathy, and um, heart failure.
So uh, it turns out it's it helpful in heart failure with, well, both kinds of heart failure. So there's heart failure with reduced ejection fraction where you have this like big dilated, weak, floppy heart and it just, the forward flow is quite poor. And then heart failure with um, preserved ejection fraction, which, you know, typically is um, a uh, often thicker heart that cannot fully relax. And so you don't get forward flow as much with that, mainly because the ventricle doesn't fill properly. So two different kinds of heart failure. It turns out these drugs uh, work extremely well in uh, in both kinds. And you wouldn't think that me as, as an emergency medicine physician would be prescribing these these drugs. But the fact of the matter is, over the last couple of years, I have prescribed these quite a bit out of the emergency department for those indications, primarily because I run into so many people that would benefit from them, are not on them. And then also, the, the real reason is that most of them cannot, at least in my population, they can't get in to see their primary. They can't get in to see their cardiologist for sometimes like three or four months. They're just completely backlogged. So, um, <clears throat> I want to keep them out of the emergency department. So if somebody comes in with uh, a mild heart failure exacerbation, but not bad enough that I need to admit them to the hospital and I can get them tuned up over the course of my, my shift um, or maybe an overnight stay in the ER, then, and if I think that they qualify and are a good candidate for it, I'll, I will start these out of the emergency department. They're, they're good drugs. They're quite safe. Uh, and they're, they work exceptionally well. There are some issues with them. Um, you know, there's obviously if you have, if you're constantly peeing glucose, you know, that's a great, uh, setup for, uh, urinary tract infection. So you got to be careful in people that get, you know, recurrent or complicated UTIs. You can get, uh, fungal infections, especially like in the genital area. And these are all like mainly in elderly diabetic people. Um, limb ulcers, um, like, Diabetic foot and, and leg ulcers are more common on these drugs, allegedly. Again, not not in otherwise healthy people, usually. Um, the one really rare um, condition that I actually I diagnosed my first case of it about two years ago is something called euglycemic DKA, which I won't get into too much. It's diabetic ketoacidosis, a serious endocrine emergency. It's, it can be fatal, obviously, if it's not treated. Um, but they come in with uh, severe ketoacidosis, but they generally have either normal or like minimally elevated blood sugars. And so if you're not clued into the fact that they're on that medication, it's, it's actually easy to miss that. And there's been case reports of that. So I uh, saw that for the first time a couple of years ago. It's not common. It's not the kind of thing you would expect uh, routinely, but it, it is out there. The one thing that you guys in the um, TRT world and androgen world might uh, be interested in knowing is that there is an association with these drugs, and I don't consider this necessarily to be an adverse effect, by the way, of uh, increasing hematocrit. And it's not just because these are these drugs act as mild diuretics. Obviously, when you when you pee out glucose, you're going to take a certain amount of water with it. So it, there is a mild diuretic property to this. But it looks like um, these drugs, especially dipagliflozin, that's the one that they looked at, uh, they're associated with increased EPO levels, okay, which obviously directly stimulates red blood cell production and so uh, a raise in hematocrit. So, and, and in heart failure patients and many patients with chronic kidney disease, that's a good thing because many of them do suffer from uh, anemia of chronic inflammation. So they're, they're anemic anyway, and so they benefit from this. But the interesting thing is it's I really don't know that you really need to be worried about this for a number of different reasons, but especially for those of you guys who happen to be on testosterone replacement therapy, the the EPO effect was most pronounced or the, the raise in elevation in hematocrit was most pronounced in the more anemic individuals, at least in these studies, and the ones with the lowest EPA level. So um, the higher their baseline hematocrit, the less of an effect there was, and which makes sense. Uh, and that correlates with their EPO levels. The higher their EPO levels, the less less of an effect there were. And we're not talking about a big effect. At the most, like in this study I was looking at earlier, they went uh, from 42.8% as a baseline hematocrit. And then over three years, that crept up to 44.8%. So we're not talking like major increases here. We're talking about two percentage points. So um, not anything in my opinion that you have to be worried about, but I'll just throw that out there because you will see it. And uh, if you're on one of these drugs and you notice a tiny bump in your hematocrit, it, um, it may be related, you know, to that, to that drug effect. So so let's switch gears a little bit here. And I, I do want to talk about 
one of the more serious adverse effects of long-term um, anabolic steroid abuse and high androgen exposure over years and decades. Uh, and obviously there's, there's a lot of them, but cardiovascular remodeling is, is one of the more pathological findings that you'll see, at least on autopsy findings. This is a paper here, Effective Androgens on Cardiovascular Remodeling, Journal of Endocrinology, 2012. And, you know, to the credit of these authors, they they talk extensively actually about the the cardioprotective aspects of testosterone. And this is a chart here that that demonstrates some of that activation of the androgen receptor within the heart. We have adaptive cardiac hypertrophy. So to be differentiated from maladaptive cardiac hypertrophy, which I'm going to show you some pretty impressive examples of that here in just a second. Okay. It blunts, you know, moving clockwise here, blunts the, uh, progression of cardiac fibrosis. Okay. And that's a big part of uh, pathological left ventricular hypertrophy and development of heart failure is cardiac fibrosis. And spoiler alert, that's one of the things that these SGLT2 drugs have been shown to do is help with cardiac fibrosis. Okay. Um, it blocks or reduces the effects of oxidative stress. It increases um, nitric oxide. So the combined effect there is you get um, vascular remodeling. So in a, in a good way, um, cardiac mitochondrial biogenesis. So it just promotes mitochondrial health, uh, energy production increases levels of ATP within the heart. And then finally, um, here it blunts cardiac apoptosis. Okay. So death of cardiac, uh, cells and promotes physiologic cardiac growth. Remember physiologic, normal physiologic growth, adaption to exercise, etc. Um, all of these things are promoted by healthy, normal testosterone levels. However, um, in, in anabolic steroid using athletes who are using many times or in many cases they're using high doses very high doses of testosterone like a gram or more per week but they're also using a number of different synthetic androgens um, many of which we know um, are associated with pathological cardiac remodeling not just of the myocytes but of the electrical system as well um, there there is some really maladaptive cardiac um, hypertrophy that goes on in those patients and i, I want to show you a, a study here and then also a, a, an actual a celebrity case report. So this is a, a 2022 paper uh, from Functional Morphology and Kinesiology, Dead Bodybuilders Speaking from the Heart, an analysis of autopsy reports of bodybuilders that died prematurely. And, you know, they review the cases here of a number of both competitive and non-competitive bodybuilders who died at relatively young ages from, uh, you know, various cardiovascular causes um, after very prolonged, like often many decades of um, androgen abuse. And there's some really interesting, they, they go through a number of different findings on their autopsies, but the, what I want to focus on is uh, specifically some of the cardiac findings and specifically the cardiomegaly and ventricular hypertrophy that was common in all of these guys. And just as an example, I mean, you guys are familiar. I know there have been some some high profile individuals in the bodybuilding community that have died suddenly um, over the last few years. I'm not going to go into that. Um, or, you know, they the the two that I'm thinking of had massively enlarged hearts um, on their autopsies, which um, were are available, you know, um, in on the internet. But th th this is another um, one that's a little bit more my generation. If you grew up in the 80s, you uh, I'm sure are familiar with this man here, the ultimate warrior, who was like a major WWF superstar, him and Hulk Hogan were like the top two guys in the 80s. So I remember as a kid watching this guy and just, you know, completely yoked, um, obviously not a natural physique, but, you know, sadly he, he passed away of a sudden massive myocardial infarction. I think he was, I think he was only 54 years old, he left a wife and he had two young daughters. So it was really, really tragic, but, um, his autopsy report is, is in the public domain as well. And I've got it up here for you. And what I want to highlight here in, in his autopsy is what we're going to see in the results of this uh, from that paper that I just brought up. Um, and I'll just read it up here. It's a massively enlarged heart. So category or under B here, it says cardiomegaly, marked. So they weighed his heart at 650 grams, which is, is huge. So uh, upper limits of normal um, uh, for a normal male, like athletic heart is, is about 400 grams. And usually it's, it's significantly less than that, but 400 is, 
you know, yes, most most pathologists will tell you upper limits is 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 400. Anything above that is there's there's something going on. So Ultimate Warriors was 650 grams. Uh, it said marked four chamber uh, dilation. So you had a big, you know, it was not only a big, thick, heavy heart, but it was also markedly dilated. So you probably had a dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. So this is what you see with prolonged androgen um, use. Also, you know, like long-standing hypertension. Now, I don't know anything about his medical history. Obviously, I don't. I don't know what his blood pressure was, but I can imagine that this guy. Um, he probably had many decades of of um, untreated or pr perhaps like partially treated hypertension, because um, th this is the kind of thing that that I see in the emergency department and people with that with that condition. So maybe not quite that much cardiomegaly, but definitely the the um, four chamber dilation and uh, and the LVH is very common with um, untreated or partially treated uh, hypertension. So uh, so very very sad case. This is a graph from that the article that I showed you, looking at the uh, weights of the uh, hearts at autopsy of the some of the bodybuilders that they they studied. You can see every single one of them had. Uh, cardiac uh, weight greater than 400 grams. One guy was over 800, which is really impressive. And then they, had, they obviously they had a control group, and you know none of these guys even approached 400. They were all, um, you know, the, and these guys were athletes as well. They just didn't have a history of anabolic steroid use, and they uh, all were sitting like just over 300 grams, which is kind of what you would expect in a um, in an athletic you know, in an athletic male. So, um, so marked cardiomegaly in all of these bodybuilders, uh, with prolonged androgen use. And then this is, um, I won't read all of this for you guys, but this is uh, summaries of the coroner's reports on some of these bodybuilders. So the highlights here, this first guy, they, they just, la they labeled some of these guys num numerically. So some of them didn't, they didn't have, um, coroner summaries on all of these guys. So that's why the numbers don't, you know, go directly in order. So this one says sudden cardiac dysrhythmia due to hypertensive cardiovascular disease, cardiomegaly with ventricular hypertrophy, anabolic steroid use as a contributing factor. This one, cause of death is steroid-induced cardiomyopathy, segmental atherosclerosis with 50% stenosis of the major arteries, left ventricular dilation is present. So you're going to see a theme here. Um, where is this one? Um, Family history of early onset atherosclerosis and hypertension, collapsed during a period of respiratory symptoms, had an abnormal electrocardiogram that met criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy. I'm going to show you what that looks like here in just a second. And then here's severe cardiomegaly with concentric left ventricular hypertrophy and then coronary artery atherosclerosis. You know, it goes on. They're all basically are saying the same thing. Um, deceased died as a result of cardiac dysrhythmia. So that's an important little factor there. Um, with this pathological hypertrophy and remodeling often involves the electrical system. And these guys um, are prone to, you know, sudden um, cardiac, often lethal cardiac dysry dys dysrhythmias, ventricular um, tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, et cetera. And, um, and people with, with regular heart failure, um, obviously, uh, prone to that as well. When their injection fraction um, gets below 30%, they often uh, will end up with a uh, implantable defibrillator in some cases, just because they're prone to sudden cardiac death. And it's no different with these with these bodybuilders. So, uh, and then the last one here, yeah, hypertensive at, uh, arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease, cardiomegaly with left ventricular hypertrophy, CAD, remote scar of myocardium. So, so this guy probably had a heart attack at some point that had scarred down and maybe he knew about it. Maybe he didn't, um, hard to say. So you see some trends there. This picture says it all here, this autopsy photo. So obviously the heart on the left, massively enlarged, clearly not not normal. And that's a normal heart on the right. Um, one of the ways that you can pick up on this as a clinician is with just a simple routine 12 lead EKG. And this is a sample of a uh, an individual who has very marked EKG changes indicating left ventricular hypertrophy. So huge R and S waves. It's not important if you don't know what those are. Um, and uh, what they call a strain pattern here in these lateral leads, so V5, V6, lead one. This is uh, very, very common, actually, and this is a fairly uh, typical EKG in somebody that has has marked LVH. This would need to be followed up uh, 
by a cardiologist, obviously, uh, this person is going to get an echocardiogram, and um, which is a is, you know is how you essentially confirm the diagnosis. And um, this is what um, I found a good video here to show you guys of what a really impressive uh, echocardiogram uh, showing uh, severe left ventricular hypertrophy. This was in a 21 uh, year old college football player who. I'm not sure if they had syncope or passed out on the field or, or what prompted it, but um, but this is a, this is a young person. So here, here's the video. Yeah. So on the left, I know if you're not familiar with these, it's kind of hard to tell, but very thick in septum here, which is the the part of the heart in between the ventricles. It's super thick, and the heart looks like it's not fully relaxing. Like this is a very thick very enlarged heart so that's what it looks like on on an on an echo and that's what you would need to get um if let's say you had an ekg that looked like this you would be uh, you would absolutely need to be referred to a, car a cardiologist and uh, and undergo an echocardiogram to get that evaluated first so uh so those of you guys who are worried about this at least go see your doctor any doctor can get an ekg uh, hopefully they can read it. Um, and then if, um, you know, if there's some concerning findings there, then ultimately you can end up, uh, getting an echo and senior cardiologist for, uh, for any, anything abnormal that shows up there. Uh, so where do the SGLT2 drugs fit into this? This is a paper here, International Immunopharmacology from 2023. New insights into the molecular mechanisms of SGLT2 inhibitor inhibitors on ventricular remodeling. So, Again, this when these drugs came out, nobody had any idea that they would have these additional effects or additional benefits. But as time has gone on, they um, have found that uh, there have been some really positive effects because a lot of diabetics also clearly also have heart failure, right? Like it's often not in isolation. So there was a you know some smart uh, researcher or clinician out there noticed, hey, these these people that are being put on these drugs for diabetes are also wow, it looks like their um, their heart failure seems to be getting better. Their kidney disease is getting better. Let's look into that a little bit further. And as as time as time has gone on, they they have realized that um, there's a lot of additional effects from these drugs, as I alluded to earlier. So this is a just a quick little uh, picture here from this paper that kind of summarizes what uh, these drugs do to the heart. And there's actually more to it than this, but this is kind of a broad overview. So they definitely improve uh, endothelial function and vascular stiffness. So we talked about up, uh, you know there's upregulation of nitric oxide, so it allows the ventricles to relax a little bit more. Fibrosis is a big problem problem in heart failure. So if a fibrotic heart is a stiff heart and you don't want that. You want a nice relaxed heart. Um, there's an influence on energy metabolism, which I think is pretty interesting. And that ties into the weight loss, which is mentioned here as well. So not only do you get visceral weight loss, um, you know, sort of throughout the body, but that epicardial and pericardial fat, which is pathologic and can cause problems, you can actually shrink that or can help to be uh, reduced with these drugs. Now, you still got to do the lifestyle stuff. You still got to exercise, et cetera. You still got to watch what you eat, but these drugs can definitely help with that. They do reduce blood pressure, probably because they are, act as mild diuretics. Um, the effect is not that impressive, but there is a statistically significant drop in blood pressure. As I mentioned earlier, there's an increase in uh, hematocrit as well. There is a um, systemic anti-inflammatory effect, which is also quite interesting to me. So you can see um, down regulation of a number of different uh, inflammatory markers in patients that takes these drugs. And, um, you know, heart failure in many cases is a is also an inflammatory condition, or at least it has a it has an inflammatory component, as do many diseases uh, we're discovering these days. So anything that can help modulate that could potentially um, you know improve outcomes, and and that's what we're finding with these drugs. It's actually really really interesting. What's also interesting is the um, the energy metabolism changes that happen within the heart. Um, this is also something that happens with with people who develop uh, cardiomegaly, uh, heart failure, LVH, et cetera, is that they have um, mitochondrial issues uh, as well. So they have a sort of a net um, reduction in ATP production uh, within the heart. So this is a diagram here that shows that. So on the left, you know, these are both uh, hearts with people that have type 2 diabetes. The one on the right is on empagliflozin, one of the SGLT2s. And we can see the differences in the energy metabolism within the heart cells themselves. So the untreated diabetic heart, they have a lot, of, they have a hard time um, oxidizing glucose. 
they have a hard time uh, producing and util utilizing ketones. And so, you know, the net effect is that they have less ATP. So less ATP, less energy, less uh, cardiac contractility. The heart is it, it, the heart will struggle. It'll struggle to keep up with with demands. When you put these people on impagal flows and you see some pretty serious changes at the cellular level um, and at the level of mitochondria, so you see increasing oxidation of glucose, you see a rise in ketone levels, uh, which is just another way of providing additional ATP. So the net effect is you get more intracellular ATP, the heart just functions better, you have more energy. So uh, in a nutshell, that's that's what happens. And uh, it's uh, it's I don't think anybody, including myself, anticipated that we'd see changes like this in a drug that, you know, on the surface just makes you pee out blood sugar. So it's interesting. Okay, I mentioned it um, It does lower blood pressure a little bit. Not a huge effect. Average, they say, is 3.62 points off your systolic, 1.7 off of your diastolic. Again, it's probably due to its antidiuretic effect. However, it also does seem to affect the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which uh, I know many of you guys are familiar with. So this is a different way of impacting that system than you know ACE inhibitors, ARBs like telmosartan, et cetera, which also impact that uh, system as well. This does it um, as well. And of course, you know you, these drugs are associated with weight loss, as I, I mentioned earlier. So uh, losing weight obviously helps with your blood pressure. So um, all of that in in uh, in total does have a very modest uh, effect on blood pressure. So and which is good because many of these these people that suffer from many many diabetics, many people with heart failure, many people with left ventricular hypertrophy also have hypertension. Right? It's usually not in isolation. So so they do tend to benefit from this. Um, I'm very interested in their effects on cardiac remodeling. So, and that, and that gets back to, you know, the potential use in, uh, in, in athletes who abuse androgens for long periods of time. So we do know that it reduces the amount of cardiac fibrosis. So it probably, and the mechanisms of this have not been worked out entirely. Um, but they do seem to be cardioprotective, uh, not just in diabetics, but also in people who, who don't have type 2 diabetes. So it's very interesting. Um, they, it does that by protecting the heart in, in many cases uh, from the negative effects of angiotensin 2. So um, again, getting back to the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, angiotensin 2 is uh, implicated in a lot of uh, pathological changes to the heart, fibrosis, uh, decreased nitric oxide, stiffening, it's, uh, worsening atherosclerosis, et cetera. And um, there's, at least in animal studies, some uh, good data that, um, that these drugs can help with that. So, And so it, these might be good not just for people uh, to use as a preventative, but there's some good data that shows that if you have established ventricular hypertrophy, getting on these drugs um, can help reverse that. And obviously, if you do the other important things you need to do in your lifestyle, the effect could be compounded. But but this is a well-established uh, phenomenon. Um, they, it's talked about quite extensively here in this 2020 paper by the European Society of Cardiology. Title says it all, Regression of Left Ventricular Hypertrophy with SGLT2 Inhibitors. And what they speculate is not only the, the effects on the renin angiotensin aldosterone system that I mentioned as being um, causal in this, but that uh, these drugs might actually uh, affect gene transcription within the heart. So affecting multiple different genes that are either turned on or turned off as a result of, um, or that contribute to uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. So again, it's the exact mechanism has not been worked out, but the fact is this is a real phenomenon and um, it's uh, it's pretty much beyond debate um, at this point. So the other interesting thing about these drugs and and this is just this is just my opinion. I suspect that these drugs might have some quote anti-aging benefits or perhaps the ability to prolong lifespan. I don't know that for sure, but I, I suspect that at the very least, they might be able to prolong health span and maybe blunt some of the negative, um, let's just say negative uh, conditions that are associated with aging. And this is a paper here that talks a little bit about this in uh, Bentham Science. It's from 2023. Again, all of this stuff, this is like fresh research. We we don't really know the answers to these questions yet, but so we're just talking about trends in the research here because these are all new papers. But this is uh, sodium glucose cotransporter 2 inhibitors and pathological cardiac hypertrophy. Um, 
why I brought this up in an anti-aging context is that in this particular paper, they cite several studies which show that these drugs not just work in all the ways that I just talked with you about, but also seem to affect mTOR, all right, mammalian target of rapamycin, which any of you guys who follow some of the you know anti-aging um, gurus out there, they love to talk about mTOR. Well, mTOR is um, the protein complex that is affected by rapamycin and rapalog. It, at least as of now, it is the gold standard in, uh, in age-defying uh, or, or life-prolonging uh, molecules, at least in animals, um, probably in humans too. We've got studies ongoing about that. But anything that could potentially uh, affect mTOR could also potentially affect lifespan in, uh, in, in, in animals. So uh, this, this paper talks about the fact that uh, we now have evidence that SGLT2 drugs do uh, act as um, at least mild to moderate mTOR inhibitors. So not as potent as rapamycin and some of the other rapalogs, but there is also that mechanism there. And so that opens up a whole other realm of possibility. Um, now, I'm not the first person to think of that because um, that's one of the things that came to mind. Much, much smarter people out there have, have speculated about this for a long time. And this is just a f few of them here that published this paper, International Journal of Molecular Sciences, Repurposing SGLT2 Inhibitors to Target Aging, Available Evidence and Molecular Mechanisms, uh, 2022. And this is a, uh, a diagram from that, uh, from that particular article. I won't belabor you with it, but because um, some of the stuff we've talked about, but the fact of the matter is if we go down to the bottom of this, all of these positive effects seem to um, modulate what's the term uh, inflammaging, which I like that term actually, because it, it talks about the fact that, you know, we're all, obviously we're all, we all age at a, at a biologically determined rate. Chronic inflammation and conditions that cause chronic inflammation are going to accelerate that. So if we can address some of those conditions, mitigate the effects of chronic inflammation, it's possible that we can slow down the aging process, prolong our lives, prolong our health span. And you see the conditions down there at the bottom that SGLT2 inhibitors have potential to, to impact for sure heart failure, for sure kidney disease, probably atherosclerosis, uh, fatty liver disease, hepatic steatosis, absolutely, uh, through its weight loss effects, new onset diabetes, there's good evidence for that. And then the net effect of that is maybe we're going to prolong our, our lifespan, prolong our health span. Um, tune in because we don't know for sure. But at least in animals, there do seem to be some some studies that uh, it, that support the fact that it can prolong lifespan. So um, that's all I have for you guys today. I think these are fascinating drugs. Um, you know, if you're a practicing um uh, internist, family medicine doc, nephrologist, cardiologist, you know about these drugs, uh, but I don't think the general public has caught on to them yet. They do stack really well with GLP-1 drugs in, in certain cases. Don't do that on your own. Talk to your doctor first, right? Because these are not risk-free. Um, but the, the effects on cardiac remodeling in particular caught my eye um, because I think there may be a role for these drugs in the whole like harm reduction uh, industry out there that um, applies to bodybuilders. So, you know, telmosartan is already like extremely popular in that community for that exact same reason, uh, nabivalol, um, a few other agents. But I don't hear anybody talking about these SGLT2 drugs yet. My prediction is that as time goes on, people will catch on with these to these drugs and um, perhaps start incorporating them into a like a harm reduction strategy for these folks. But even if even if you don't abuse androgens, there may be uh, some very good. Um, there's a good possibility that these may have uh, health promoting and perhaps life extension properties. We don't know yet. I don't know for sure. I am reserved I'm withholding judgment at this point, but I think that uh, what I've seen so far looks fairly promising. So that's all I have for you guys. If you have used these drugs before, if you have experience with them, either with yourself, family members, et cetera, if you've had any adverse effects from these, let me know. Uh, I always appreciate hearing from you guys. I'll talk to you next time. Bye. All man medicine video and audio has been created and shared online for informational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute the practice of medicine or professional healthcare services of any kind including the giving of medical advice. I am not your doctor. No doctor-patient relationship has been established. This content is not meant to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied upon solely for that purpose either. The only purpose of this content is to present peer-reviewed, research-backed health information for your consideration. 
As always, rely on the advice and guidance of your personal physician before undertaking any activity presented here. And if in doubt or not comfortable with said activity, practice discretion. Your health is your responsibility and not ours. Finally, I take conflicts of interest seriously. I accept no compensation whatsoever from any private corporations, including pharmaceutical or supplement companies. You can trust that if I recommend a medication, product, or service, it's because I genuinely believe in it and not because I'm being paid to endorse it.